Welcome to the Deep in State presented by Eclipse. I'm Nick Hawks. And on today's episode, we have Mario Dio, the VP of Wireless Convergence over at Nova Labs. This episode is sponsored by Eclipse Labs. If you're pushing the limits of what's possible on chain, you should build your own rollup with Eclipse. We'll have a little bit more on them later in the show. Before we get started, remember to hit the like and subscribe button. This alerts you to when the next episode drops and helps us bring great guests like Mario on the show. Mario, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm I'm excited. So you do wireless convergence, but this show is really going to be about the Wi-Fi side. Let's start off with kind of the, the basic question is, how is Wi-Fi different than other wireless protocols, maybe in terms of, of range and edge? Yeah, you know, um, you touch on the wireless convergence. So as you know, specifically, uh, we have, uh, um, you know, CBRS radios that are deployed. And now we're looking into Wi-Fi. And there is some structural differences of Wi-Fi as compared to let's say a cellular standard like LT and, and, and similar. The biggest changes difference is that usually Wi-Fi, actually Wi-Fi runs on a, a licensed spectrum, which means there's a spectrum that can be accessed by anyone, any, anybody, so long you are complying with certain regulations. And what that entails, entails that usually, and that's probably what everyone is uh, experiencing specifically, uh, there are two major bandwidth that bands that are being used for Wi-Fi. One is 2.4 gigahertz. The other one is 5 gigahertz. That is something coming up at 6 gigahertz. We'll probably touch on a little bit later. But um, really, it's about the interference problem. So the fact that usually on a licensed spectrum is gets utilized by multiple parties, and that is, um, there are algorithms within the standard that try to do collision avoidance and to mm. you know minimize okay. the amount of interference so that's the biggest change in terms of range and and performance what you would notice usually when you compare let's say a wi-fi as opposed to an lt or a 5g radio is that the drop off at the edges is much more gradual on the lt and, and 5g standard than it is on wi-fi that being said though the latest rev revisions of wi-fi you probably heard wi-fi 6 6e and now there is a mm -hmm. lot of talk around wi-fi 7 they actually, they're meant to help with a lot of those, uh, specifically about interference dodging and, um, you know, they make available more spectrum and also their link adaptation, which is the capability of the standard to adapt to when the person is moving in the coverage area gets actually better at the edges. So things are improving on that front. But in general, if you have to think about Wi-Fi versus LTE and 5G, think about a licensed spectrum and think about uh, a little more of a, sharp edges of the, of the coverage area. Yeah, that was an interesting thing when I read uh, what you'd written about that, which is, you know, we just assume that the signal gets weaker and weaker as you go away, but Wi-Fi, it just drops. So that's, that's kind of a, yeah, just like a neat thing to know. Um, let's see, as we get into the helium side, it's pretty important to get the nomenclature straight. Uh, what are these Wi-Fi devices called? Are they gateways? Are they routers? Are they access points? Like what, what do we want to call right. it? Great question. So um, those, we call them Helium Mobile Hotspot. Um, and really um, what they are is the combination of, uh, um, of, a, of a gateway and the radio. So what you have into the CBRS world, you have the, let's say the Freedom 5 gateway, then you have the different type of radios. There are two different devices. In the case of Wi-Fi, those are combined. So actually you have in the same box, you have both the radio the radio emitting radio frequency as well as the gateway that takes care of all the all the crypto related operations. So that's that's the major. Okay. okay. And then can a helium mobile hotspot replace the current Wi-Fi? For most people, they just call it a thing. Like I was talking to my dad the other day, and you know, modem router, he doesn't give a shit. It's just the Wi-Fi is down. But can a uh, can a helium mobile hotspot replace my current maybe uh, router in my house? Well. Um, in our first intended use case, we're trying to create a network to offload mobile traffic, meaning traffic that comes from mobile subscribers. So in that sense, those devices are appliances that do not substitute your home Wi-Fi, at least at the beginning with the initial use cases. So those are Wi-Fi that specialize into seamlessly onboarding mobile subscriber to offload data. Um, of course, in the future, this can, can be evolved. It can become something else. Um, but for the, uh, you know, for bootstrapping um, and the primary use case for us, it is the mobile, the mobile offload. Got it. 
And then let's see, Amir Halim has said that Wi-Fi is better for handoffs than CBRS. Do you see this as something that replaces CBRS or is it something that enhances the network overall? No, uh, exactly. Great point. That's go back to the this concept of wireless convergence. I, I use I often use the term the right tool for the right job. I don't think at all the Wi-Fi substitutes CBRS. There are indeed some differences, of course, in the way that devices handle the roaming, the roaming in and out of CBRS versus the handoff with Wi-Fi. It's probably just a matter of, if nothing else, um, time. You know, Wi-Fi has been in mobile devices for a long time, and so they've been working out all the all the details about how to optimize hand in and hand out for a longer time than CBRS, specifically when you look at multiple multi-SIM environment. But in terms of use cases in the of how those serve users, you know, Wi-Fi is an enhancement to CBRS. CBRS, to, you know, as we talked about, the edges, the general coverage, the fact that even though it's not licensed spectrum, it's shared spectrum in the CBRS radio, you have for the time that you are allocated in that frequency, you have the exclusive use of those 20 megahertz. So the quality of services, you don't have the interference problem that Wi-Fi has. For example, CBRS handles better when you have hundreds of users accessing the same the, the same cell. So there is mechanism within CBRS that make it more um, uh, more suited for certain types of use cases as opposed to Wi-Fi. Is that that it will it, it will be for other type of use cases. So it's really about both, and that's this idea of this convergence. And so no, it's not one either or. It's actually an, an enhancement. Got it. Not a replacement, but an enhancement. Super cool. Uh, let's take a quick break and talk about today's show's sponsor, Eclipse Labs. One of the super cool parts about doing this show is that we get to talk to tons of projects across the space, including back-end nerdy stuff that uh, helps deepen projects. One of those is today's show's sponsor, Eclipse Labs. They're a customizable roll-up provider deploying app-specific chains for several deepened projects. They allow you to pick your virtual machine, your base layer, and additional customizations to enable, enable new functionality for your DApp. They're committed to helping projects build on Deepin. Check them out at eclipse.builders and check the card above for a link to an interview we did with them if you haven't seen it. Eclipse has been a super cool thing that Max and I have seen uh, really getting start to used across the space. Let's see. Um, let's talk about how, how uh, price compares. Maybe you don't uh, need to talk about exactly how much it'll cost, but there have been some teasers out there suggesting that Wi-Fi parts are cheaper than CBRS. Is there going to be a huge difference? Is it going to be 10 times cheaper, half the price? Like, what are we kind of looking at as far as pricing versus the CBRS uh, setups? Well, I mean, uh, I don't know if I can speak about quantitatively yet. I think it will get into a lot of issues in doing that, but I can. I think it's no surprise yeah, yeah. to anybody. I think it's been pretty clear the fact that these are um, they're going to be cheaper devices, um, and uh, uh, in in the order like you know hundreds, maybe low few hundreds of dollars. Um, of course, it will depend. Okay. It will depend on the version. If it is an indoor versus an outdoor rugged ice, you know, there is actually a lot of what have we learned a lot as we develop Wi-Fi is that there is actually a lot of different type of chipsets with different grading, enterprise grading. And uh, um, another thing that we would like to remember as well is that because we are targeting this mobile offload use case, the type of Wi-Fi chipset that we are targeting are actually enterprise grade chipset. They're able to handle many users. They have a set of capability mm -hmm. that supports things like Passpoint. Not, it's not just your um, your best buy access point, that's not the same chipset that we we're going to use in this in these units because the capabilities and the grading that we need is different. That being said, it's pretty clear to everybody that Wi-Fi ecosystem is, is much more developed from the point of view of makers. And so the price, and there is also a reason for these two things have a completely different price point. But yes, yeah, yeah, so we are expecting to be cheaper devices um, with Wi-Fi as a as an addition and as an enhancement to the network to add more coverage in that way. Cool. Super cool. What's the, so the indoor range, I guess, doesn't really matter. You just check uh, access points wherever you need them. What's the outdoor range look like on the bigger radios? The, how does it compare to the 430 outdoor, the 436, the, the smaller and larger outdoor ones that people are used to? Well, I mean, um, as I say, if you take about the, um, we have done some initial testing um, and we do this, of course, for developing a solution. And um, we think what, what usually happens is that in the vicinity of the, of the access point, 
um, they actually the throughput that you get from even Wi-Fi six devices outdoor is it can be as high as a one gigabit symmetrical. You know, they support one point two with two by two um, for 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 close distance. Then what happens is as you move away, what happens that up to when you get to like 400, 400, 500 feet in line of sight, you can still get 100 megabit or so. And then there is this drop off, this kind of like what I was mentioning before, this cliff. The and cliff, that's where yeah. usually the LT will perform better because he has a better long over over those, those type of distances. So as I say, it, it depends. But, you know, we can expect it with outdoor to be definitely in the, in the 400, 500 feet in line of sight with, you know, hundreds uh, of megabit or megabit uh, on there. On the, of course, again, this is Wi-Fi, which means that the reproducibility of all these tests will depend greatly on the, on the environment around you, on the amount of radios around you, the amount of networks around yeah. you. Um, that's why in the HIP, which is what we were probably about to discuss even more details, that we refer mostly about five gigahertz as propagation. And those tests that I just mentioned are in five gigahertz because in five gigahertz spectrum, and it would be even more of six gigahertz, but you have more chance to find a clean spot of the spectrum to do those tests as opposed to 2.4, in which you only have effectively three channels that get utilized by everybody. Um, so as we mm. move, in Wi-Fi 6, we still have these two bands. So 5 gigahertz is, is much more probable to have space over the air. And then as, as you add the 6 gigahertz with Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 7, you'll have almost 1. Point, you have 1.2 gigahertz more spectrum that you can select of. So at that point, I would say it's almost guaranteed that you'll be able to find a completely clean channel uh, to do this. And that's where we're aiming for and uh, to maximize the throughput and maximize the coverage. Got and it. and, the, yeah, and one, have like have say, a, the access a, point, sorry, uh, just one more important point is that the access point actually uses yeah. this thing, this feature called ACS, automatic channel selection. So it actually is able to listen the environment and select the channel that, that makes the most, the most sense given the environment. Okay. Ah, so it's something similar to the LoRaWAN side. I think it's the ABP, mm -hmm. the, the same kind of thing where it's like, hey, what's the best uh, to, to uh, band a transmit on depending on what's going on around us? All right. Super cool. Um, we may have to have you on for another one to get super deep into the into the hip because there's an awful lot to talk about there. You want to talk about this assisted GPS thing? Um, there are definitely indoor CBRS radios that can't get a GPS lock, and they stop transmitting. Is that going to be the same case for these Wi-Fi access points for these Helium Mobile hotspots? So the way indoor gets and location gets asserted for Wi-Fi, it is different than CBRS, and that's because for uh, indoor radios. Generally, it's it generically that you don't have a GPS embedded in the device. And so the way we've been structuring that also in the hip is uh, utilizing, basically you, you do the onboarding, you, utilizing your, the Helium mobile app, um, specifically a section on the hotspot side. And then the, the location that gets assessed in the phone is the location that, that basically would be assigned to the, to the Wi-Fi hotspot. That location gets assigned using a GPS, which is assisted GPS, which is a technology that utilizes on the phone, that utilizes not only the location coordinates that come from GPS, but also information regarding the cellular networks around and the Wi-Fi networks around you. The end result is that as compared to G regular GPS, a GPS gives you actually much more accurate, um, much more accurate uh, um, position. That's what allow us today you know, to to navigate inside the urban canyon in downtown or, or even having indoor location, which is like, how can it be with just, just GPS? It's not just GPS. It's actually GPS, which is added by all those things. So in, in Wi-Fi, we'll use the A-GPS from the phone to do a first assertion of the location. And then another thing right. that is also written in the HIP is uh, um, the idea of utilizing third-party location database services that can actually validate the location uh, given like the Wi-Fi scans of the of the environment. So we have this these layers of uh, of uh, validation of the assertion of the location. For outdoor unit for Wi-Fi right now, the plan is to have GPS in those units because it's much simpler and will allow us to you know to get directly the the um, the location from the from the radio from the outdoor. Got it. Well, we'll have to figure out a way to loop in GeoNet. They've got the the centimeter accurate positioning 
uh, piece with the base stations. But that's probably, an, again, another call. Let's uh, wrap this thing up. If it's so cheap um, and other than the range, it seems so much better in every way. Why should the mobile sub DAO even make it a question of which one to deploy? I know Max has talked about this in the past. TBRS is still during data transfer rewards, but from a proof of coverage standpoint, it seems like we'd want to incentivize Wi-Fi as much as possible. Is that something where you're thinking that sounds about right or you'd like to see some changes there? Well, I think that the way the uh, the HIP is written actually takes into account a little bit of the nature of Wi-Fi. I'll give you an example. Uh, the CBRS, mm. if you compare the CBRS indoor versus a Wi-Fi indoor, the CBRS indoor as the flower for proof of coverage, as opposed to the Wi-Fi um, that basically rewards, the CBRS indoor rewards the X when, when the device is onboarded, as well as the, the X is around that REST 12 hexagon. Uh, for the Wi-Fi, we are proposing to just the reward the hexagon where the Wi-Fi is deployed. So I still think that uh, um, CBRS has the potential to have bigger range and, and hence, you know, whatever it comes up with that, with a bigger uh, coverage. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that mm -hmm. it's Wi-Fi. As I say, it's it's uh, it's more Wi-Fi and less the CBRS. I really think that from our perspective, you know, we started with a, with, there is a build page, you know, hello, Helium. if you haven't done it, please check it out. We're going to keep adding content there on how to, uh, how to better serve your use case. Like, uh, you want to use a CBRS versus, you know, use a Wi-Fi, depending on, on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so I think that's the way we should really look at this. That being said, of course, the lower entry, uh, the lower price is a good entry point for, especially for new, new people that we want to attract to the space. Got it. Super helpful. Mario, thanks a ton for coming on the show today. Um, let's see. I don't know. I know I don't need to tell you this because you're already a subscriber, but make sure that if uh, if you aren't, that you hit the like and subscribe button so that we keep this thing going and make sure we get great news out to you uh, watching. Mario, thanks a ton for coming on, man. Thank you so much, Nick, and um, see you soon.